Hey everyone, how's it going? It's 2 a.m. as I'm recording this right now, and I want to talk about tanks. Not the ones that actually worked out, mind you, but rather the ones that never went into official production or never left the drawing board in the first place. We'll be limiting ourselves here to just six American designs, as each major world power can be a video in its own right. We'll go ahead and make a little list in the process, going from the least odd to the most odd, in my opinion. We'll go ahead and get right into it and start with two that I'll put in a tie for fifth place. The Lion's Electric Gyro Cruiser and the Schumann Super Dreadnought share a spot for both being these conceptual massive mobile fortresses. Both designed in 1916, each of these massive and conceptually ridiculous tanks demonstrate how experimental and not understood armored warfare was at its earliest stages. So instead of designing a large vehicle that would be manned by a small crew, some designed what were essentially land ships with crews dozens or even hundreds strong. The Gyro Cruiser looks nothing like any tank that would eventually be made, and it is very likely that it could not have been feasibly made regardless. Appearing in the February 1916 edition of Electrical Experimenter, Eric Lyon envisioned a vehicle measuring 160 feet tall, 230 feet long, and 86 feet wide. This massive two-wheeled beast sat at a listed weight of 20,000 tons and would be able to reach speeds of 60 miles an hour. It would stay upright by its front wheel also being a gyroscope, as the wheel would be hollow and filled with 12 hollow iron balls, each weighing 40 tons. The remainder of the space in the wheel would be filled with water, or rather oddly, liquid mercury. If it would be filled with mercury, though, it would make the weight of the front wheel alone over 60,000 tons, given its size. The total armament of this beast was to be at least 12 17-inch guns scattered about on the vehicle. The Super Dreadnought, on the other hand, is slightly more practical, and that's saying something, and more consistent with early tank concepts at the time, but again, that is saying something. Appearing in Popular Science Magazine in 1916, Frank Schumann envisioned this massive tricycle-looking tank with wheels 200 feet in diameter, 300 feet in total length, and weighing around 5,000 tons. He claimed that it would be able to reach speeds of nearly 100 miles an hour and could scale 50-foot hills with ease. It would be unarmed and would simply rely on its sheer size and a collection of large chains dangling from the body to destroy whatever it rode across. Now, despite the clear absurdity of these designs, I will put them at number 5 for one very specific reason, in that they likely weren't meant to be all that serious. Specifically, with the Lion's Gyro Cruiser, the fact that it was an electrical experimenter gives more credence to this idea. The magazine was edited by a man named Hugo Gernsback, who was recorded writing in 1916 that writers for the magazine should be more imaginative and experimental. Additionally, the magazine also published some science fiction stories starting in 1915. So basically, given the overall absurdity of the design and the medium in which it was published, it is rather likely that the design was pretty tongue-in-cheek. The same can be said for the Super Dreadnought, as when it appeared in Popular Science, the magazine was in the midst of a change from a more scholarly journal to a more widely read, casual science-centered magazine. So, if these tanks weren't meant to be all that serious designs, and were meant to just be more eye-catching, thought-provoking pieces, then I can only rank them so high when it comes to strange designs. At number four, in what is easily the most reasonable and practical tank here, the Skeleton Tank, built in 1918, mimicked the overall design of British tanks of the time. Wanting to make a lightweight tank that could cross over trenches, the Pioneer Tractor Company made what was effectively a heavily stripped-down version of a British tank. It hollowed out basically everything that wasn't absolutely necessary, and in an endeavor to maintain its structural integrity, iron plumbing pipes were used to fill in all of the gaps. The two-man crew, located in the metal box suspended in the center, consisted of a driver and a gunner, armed with a 30 caliber machine gun. 
with this heavily stripped down design, it was considerably lighter than its British counterparts, weighing just 9 tons instead of almost 30 tons, while maintaining the half-inch armor plating that the British tanks had. Also, since a great deal of the frame was iron plumbing pipes, it was rather easy to repair if damaged. Hypothetically as well, a good deal of the rounds fired at the tank would be able to just pass through the various openings, leaving the vital bits of the tank undamaged. Conceptually speaking, the skeleton tank isn't all that different from other tanks at the time. It's just the skeletonized frame makes it look really bizarre and different, like it was never finished. If it had actually made it to battle, it would probably have performed somewhat similarly to the British tanks, but it was never adopted, so just the single prototype would be made. Moving on to our number three design, we move to the Second World War. At this point, tank design had been generally settled upon, and most tanks looked conceptually similar in that sort of trapezoid shape. This didn't stop Frank Rona, though, who designed a tank that looked like it was inspired by an Airstream or Bolus trailer. This is the pill-shaped Rona tank. U.S. Patent, U.S. 2319178. Likely designed with bullet and round deflection in mind, the tank was cylindrical with a pointed nose and sat on a very strangely small set of tank treads. The main armament consisted of two non-specific large caliber cannons jutting out of the front, kind of resembling bug antenna. It would also be outfitted with four non-specific machine guns, two on each side. The thickness of the armor was not mentioned in the patent, simply being listed as heavy armor plate. Now, just looking at the overall design, there are several very clear issues. First off, while the two cannons at the front are symmetrical, which is nice visually, they are impractically located. The cannons can't hit something that's directly in front of the tank, and with the small size of the cutouts for the barrels, it gives these cannons very little range of motion. This meant that the tank would have to be lined up at rather unintuitive angles to be properly lined up for an attack. Also, the situations in which two cannons pointed in opposite directions like that would be practical or viable would be few and far between. So it likely would have been in the tank's best interest to have just a single gun directly front and center. This wouldn't fix the tank's design or make it even remotely viable, but it would at least make it more practical. The bigger issue, though, was how small the tank treads were in relation to the body. Both the front and rear had a significant portion of the tank body just hanging over the treads. This creates a very clear issue in that if the tank encountered a big divot in the ground, something that would be rather common on the battlefield with all the explosions and whatnot, it would get stuck. It would just be perched over a hole, unable to move. Also, given that the main cannons do not appear to be able to move all that much vertically, the fact that it would have to rely on hills and valleys to help it aim make this flaw even worse. Also, also, given that the massively oversized hull would have to be rather heavily armored, meant that a great deal of weight would be on the small treads, increasing the likelihood that it would just sink into the ground and get stuck. Basically, uh, you get the gist. This thing had so many design flaws that the U.S. military wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. Frank still believed in his design, though, and sent it off to the Canadian military for their consideration, where it would similarly be ignored. For our number two design, we move back to the First World War and find a tank attempting to innovate trench warfare. Trenches provided solid cover from enemy fire, but were very inconveniently stuck firmly into the ground. Now, what if you could take that trench with you, giving soldiers a mobile wall for cover against enemy fire? This is where George Roy and Pyotr Zarnopsky come in with their so-called infantry fort, filed for patent just two days before World War I would end on November 9, 1918. Looking like a doorstop on treads, the clear idea was to have a mobile armored wall and shooting platform for soldiers to use. The triangular front with armor plating would help deflect the rounds fired at it, while the steps on the back would give soldiers multiple shooting platforms or multiple potential shooting stances. The small door you see on the side would presumably house weapons, more soldiers, and or the driver and engine. 
However, in the patent, there is no listed control method or even a spot where the driver would be, so it is unclear how this would have been controlled at all. At the very back of the tank, there are also two little anchor spikes that would help keep this vehicle in place if need be. Looking at the patent schematics, there is an issue that should be pretty apparent here. These soldiers stationed on the platform were completely unprotected from the top, sides, and rear. The armor provided by the tank would be basically pointless against enemies not directly in front of it. If engaged from any other direction, it would basically just make the soldiers riding it a slightly elevated, completely exposed target. Even just a simple grenade thrown next to the tank would be enough to subvert its protection. Considering the cost of outfitting the treads with this armor, it would have made much more sense just to build a normal tank that provided 360 degree protection with firepower much greater than a simple soldier's rifle. Also, consider the fact that a much simpler and more practical version of this was made three years prior, and even that wasn't adopted. This hand push shield on ped rail tracks was made in 1915 and was easier to use, cheaper to make, and probably would have been more effective since it would have greater mobility, and even then it wasn't used. While I at least understand the concept of the infantry fort, it would have been completely pointless to make it over an actual normal tank. Still though, I can at least understand the idea behind it, unlike our number one tank here. Now, I'd like you to picture in your mind a simple pillbox. Looking at it, do you have the thought, it would be so much better if that pillbox could jump? If you do have that thought, let me just say, hello, Mr. Henry Wallace, so glad you could rise from the grave to watch my video. And yes, in October 1942, a man named Henry Wallace of Freeport, New York, filed a patent for a one-legged tank that could jump as a means of propulsion. Armed with six machine guns stationed at 60 degree increments, the Wallace Leaping Tank was basically just an armored cylinder with a telescoping leg in the bottom center. A driver would be stationed at the top of the cylinder with a little armored nub sticking out of the top with a small little slit for viewing. The driver could rotate this little nub 360 degrees and use the machine guns as needed, or perhaps six additional men would man the guns, we don't know because Wallace doesn't say. Of course, though, the most fascinating thing about this is the telescoping leg and how the tank would move. The singular leg here provided two hypothetical methods of movement. The more practical method, and practical is in big quotation marks there, would have been to fully retract the leg into the hull, where the leg platform would move ever so slightly in a given direction and slide the hull forward in that direction. It would basically look like a tank version of a dog with an itchy butt, slowly scraping across the ground. The other, more fantastical way of moving would be for the machine to somehow leap forward. I assume that would be done by somehow forcefully extending the leg, but I can't imagine that this would be safe for the driver or potential crew, and would likely cause the tank to fall over and crash almost every time, and severely injure everyone inside. With all the other tanks listed, I can at least see the idea behind their designs, even if the designs were stupid, impractical, or fantastical. But this one, even being patented so that no one could steal this marvelous design, I really can't think of how Mr. Wallace made this and thought it was brilliant or viable in any real way. It seems like the kind of design you'd see in a parody war movie. I can clearly see a scene of Wallace happily presenting his creation to the military, where he then proceeds to show off the jump feature, launch into a tree or rock, and explode as Dwight Eisenhower looks on and solemnly shakes his head. I legitimately can't imagine what Wallace was thinking, and because of that, I think the Wallace Leaping Tank is far and away the weirdest tank concept I have ever seen. And thus ends my list. I should make some honorable mentions to the Alligator Tank, the SPG, the Combination Vehicle, and the America First Tank. If your list would look any different, feel free to put it down in the comments below. And while you're down there, remember to like the video, subscribe, and hit the bell. Maybe check out some of my other videos as well and listen to my very sultry and suave voice. 
Tell a friend about this channel. Tell a mortal enemy. Talk to your doctor and ask if my channel is right for you. I hope you enjoyed this week's video, and I hope you learned something in the process. See you next week. Bye.